This is section six of Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The World Famed Genius, Part One, read by John Greenman. Art transmitting the simplest feelings of common life, but such, always, as are accessible to all men in the whole world, the art of common life, the art of a people universal art tolstoy what is art some years ago a group of mark twain's friends in a spirit of fun addressed a letter to mark twain god knows where though taking a somewhat circuitous route the letter went unerringly to its goal and it was not long before the senders of that letter received the laconic but triumphant reply he did they now turned the tables on the jubilant author who equally as quickly received a letter addressed mark twain the devil knows where it seemed that he did too in his lifetime mark twain won a fame that was literally world-wide a fame indeed which seemed to extend to realms peopled by noted theological characters from very humble beginnings he used facetiously to speak of coming up from the very dregs of society mark twain achieved international eminence and repute this accomplishment was due to the power of brain and personality alone in this sense his career is unprecedented and unparalleled in the history of american literature it is a mark of the democratic independence of america that she has betrayed a singular indifference to the appraisal of her literature at the hands of foreign criticism upon her writers who have exhibited derivative genius irving hawthorne emerson longfellow american criticism has lavished the most extravagant eulogiums the three geniuses who have made permanent contributions to world literature who have either embodied in the completest degree the spirit of american democracy or who have had the widest following of imitators and admirers in foreign countries still await their final and just deserts at the hands of critical opinion in their own land the genius of edgar allan poe gave rise to schools of literature on the continent of europe yet in america his name must remain for years debarred from inclusion in a so-called hall of fame walt whitman and mark twain the two great interpreters and embodiments of america represent the supreme contribution of democracy to universal literature in so far as it is legitimate for any one to be denominated a self-made man in literature these men are justly entitled to such characterization they owe nothing to european literature their genius is supremely original native democratic the case of mark twain which is our present concern is a literary phenomenon which imposes upon criticism peculiarly upon american criticism the distinct obligation of tracing the steps in his unhalting climb to an eminence that was international in its character and of defining those signal qualities traits characteristics individual literary social racial national which compassed his world-wide fame for if it be true that the judgment of foreign nations is virtually the judgment of posterity then is mark twain already a classic upon the continent of europe mark twain first received notable recognition in france at the hands of that brilliant woman madame blanc therese benson who devoted so much of her energies to the popularization of american literature in europe that one of her series of essays upon the american humorists which dealt with mark twain appeared in the revue des deux mondes in 1872 in it appeared her admirable translation of the jumping frog there is no cause for surprise that a scholarly frenchwoman reared on classic models and confined by rigid canons of art should stand aghast at this boisterous barbaric irreverent jester from the wilds of america 
when it is remembered that mark twain began his career as one of the sagebrush writers and gave free play to his passion for horseplay his desire to lay a mine for the other fellow and his defiance of the traditional and the classic it is not to be wondered that madame blanc while honoring him with recognition in the most authoritative literary journal in the world could not conceal an expression of amazement over his enthusiastic acceptance in english-speaking countries mark twain's jumping frog should be mentioned in the first place as one of his most popular little stories almost a type of the rest it is nevertheless rather difficult for us to understand while reading this story the roars of laughter that it excited in australia and in india in new york and in london the numerous editions of it which appeared the epithet of inimitable that the critics of the english press have unanimously awarded to it we may remark that a persian of montesquieu a huron of voltaire even a simple peruvian woman of madame de graffigny reasons much more wisely about european civilization than an american of san francisco the fact is that it is not sufficient to have wit or even natural taste in order to appreciate works of art it is the right of humorists to be extravagant but still common sense although carefully hidden ought sometimes to make itself apparent in mark twain the protestant is enraged against the pagan worship of broken marble statues the democrat denies that there was any poetic feeling in the middle ages the sublime ruins of the Colosseum only impressed him with the superiority of america which punishes its criminals by forcing them to work for the benefit of the state over ancient rome which could only draw from the punishments which it inflicted the passing pleasure of a spectacle in the course of this voyage in company with mark twain we at length discover under his good fellowship and apparent ingeniousness faults which we should never have expected he has in the highest degree that fault of appearing astonished at nothing common we may say to all savages he confesses himself that one of his great pleasures is to horrify the guides by his indifference and stupidity he is too decidedly envious we could willingly pardon him his patriotic self-love often wounded by the ignorance of europeans above all in what concerns the new world if only that national pride were without mixture of personal vanity but how comes it that mark twain so severe upon those poor turks finds scarcely anything to criticize in russia where absolutism has nevertheless not ceased to flourish we need not seek far for the cause of this indulgence the czar received our ferocious republicans the empress and the grand duchess mary spoke to them in english taking the pleasure trip on the continent altogether does it merit the success it enjoys in spite of the indulgence that we cannot but show to the judgments of a foreigner while recollecting that those amongst us who have visited america have fallen doubtless under the influence of prejudices almost as dangerous as ignorance into errors quite as bad in spite of the wit with which certain pages sparkle we must say that this voyage is very far below the less celebrated excursions of the same author in his own country three years later madame blanc returns to the discussion of mark twain in an essay in the revue des deux mondes entitled l'âge d'or en amérique an elaborate review and analysis of the gilded age the savage charm and real simplicity of mark twain are not lacking in appeal even to her sophisticated intelligence and she is inclined to infer that jovial irony and animal spirits are qualities sufficient to amuse a young nation of people like the americans who do not like the french 
pique themselves upon being blase according to her judgment mark twain and charles dudley warner are lacking in the requisite mental grasp for the stupendous task of interpreting the great tableau of the american scene nor does she regard their effort at collaboration as a success from the standpoint of art the charm of colonel sellers wholly escapes her she cannot understand the almost loving appreciation with which this cheaply gross forerunner of the later american industrial brigand was greeted by the american public the book repels her by that mixture of good sense with mad folly disorder but she praises mark twain's accuracy as a reporter the things which offend her sensibilities are the wilful exaggeration of the characters and the jests which are so elaborately constructed that the very theme itself disappears under the mass of embroidery which overlays it the audacities of a bret hart the grosser temerities of a mark twain still astonish us she concludes but soon we shall become accustomed to an american language whose savory freshness is not to be disdained awaiting still more delicate and refined qualities that time will doubtless bring in translating the jumping frog into faultless french giving mark twain the opportunity for that delightful retranslation into english which furnished delight for thousands in reviewing with elaboration and long citations the innocents abroad and the gilded age madame blanc introduced mark twain to the literary public of france and emile blemont in his esquisse americaine de mark twain eighteen eighty one still further enhanced the fame of mark twain in france by translating a number of his slighter sketches in eighteen eighty six eugene Faure published in the revue des deux mondes an exhaustive review with long citations of life on the mississippi under the title les caravans d'un humoriste and his prefatory remarks in regard to mark twain's fame in france at that time may be accepted as authoritative he pointed out the praiseworthy efforts that had been made to popularize these transatlantic gaieties to import into france a new mode of comic entertainment yet he felt that the peculiar twist of national character the type of wit peculiar to a people and a country the specialized conception of the vie comique revealed in mark twain's works confined them to a restricted milieu the result of all the efforts to popularize mark twain in france he makes plain was an almost complete check for to the french taste mark twain's pleasantry appeared macabre his wit brutal his temperament dry to excess by some indeed his exaggerations were regarded as symptoms of mental alienation and the originality of his verve did not succeed in giving a passport to the incoherence of his conceptions it has been said remarked m forgue with keen perception that an academician slumbers in the depths of every frenchman and it was this which prevented the success of mark twain in france humour in france has its laws and its restrictions so the french public saw in mark twain a gross jester incessantly beating upon a tom-tom to attract the attention of the crowd they were tenacious in resisting all such blandishments as a humorist mark twain was never appreciated in france the appreciation he ultimately recured an appreciation by no means inconsiderable though in no sense comparable to that one in anglo-saxon and germanic countries was due to his sagacity and penetration as an observer and to his marvelous faculty for calling up scenes and situations by the clever use of the novel and the imprevu there was even to the frenchman a certain lively appeal in an intelligence absolutely free of convention sophistication or reverence for traditionary views qua traditionary though at first the salt of mark twain's humor seemed to the french to be lacking in the attic flavor this new mode of comic entertainment 
the leisurely exposition of the genially naive american in time won its way with the blase parisians travelers who could find no copy of the bible in the street bookstalls of paris were confronted everywhere with copies of roughing it when the authoritative edition of mark twain's works appeared in english that authoritative french journal the mercure de france paid him this distinguished tribute his public is as varied as possible because of the versatility and suppleness of his talent which addresses itself successively to all classes of readers he has been called the greatest humorist in the world and that is probably the truth but he is also a charming and attractive story-teller an alert romancer a clever and penetrating observer a philosopher without pretensions and therefore all the more profound and finally a brilliant essayist nevertheless the observations of m borg is just and authentic the attic flavor of l'esprit gaulois is alien to the loosely articulated structure of american humor the noteworthy criticism which mark twain directed at paul bourget's outre-mer and the subsequent controversy incident thereto forced into light the racial and temperamental dissimilarities between the gallic and the american Ausschauung. mr clemens once remarked to me that of all continental peoples the french were most alien to the spirit of his humor in le figaro at the time of mark twain's death this fundamental difference in taste once more comes to light it is as difficult for a frenchman to understand mark twain as for a north american to admire la fontaine at first sight there is nothing in common between that highly specialized faculty which the anglo-saxons of the old and the new world designate under the name of humor and that quality with us which we call wit esprit and yet at bottom these two manifestations of the human genius so different in appearance have a common origin and reach the same result they are both of them the glorification of good sense presented in pleasing and unexpected form only this form must necessarily vary with peoples who do not speak the same language and whose skulls are not fashioned in the same way in italy as in france the peculiar timbre of mark twain's humor found an audience not wholly sympathetic not thoroughly au courant with his spirit translation however accurate and conscientious as the italian critic raphael simboli has pointed out fails to render the special flavor of his work and then in italy where humorous writing generally either rests on a political basis or depends on risky phrases mark twain's sketches are not appreciated because the spirit which breathes in them is not always understood the story of the jumping frog for instance famous as it is in america and england has made little impression in france or italy it was rather among the germanic peoples and those most closely allied to them the scandinavians that mark twain found most complete and ready response at first blush it seems almost incredible that the writings of mark twain with their occasional slang their colloquialisms and their local peculiarities of dialect should have borne translation so well into other languages especially into german it must however be borne in mind that despite these peculiar features of his writings they are couched in a style of most marked directness simplicity and native english purity the ease with which his works were translated into foreign especially the germanic and allied tongues and the eager delight with which they were read and comprehended by all classes high and low constitute perhaps the most signal conceivable tribute not only to the humanity of his spirit but to the genuine art of his marvelously forthright and natural style it need be no cause for surprise that as early as eighteen seventy two he had secured tauschnitz of leipzig for his continental agent 
German translation soon appeared of The Jumping Frog and Other Stories, 1874, The Gilded Age, 1874, The Innocents Abroad and the New Pilgrim's Progress, 1875, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, 1876. A few years later his sketches, many of them, were translated into virtually all printed languages, notably into Russian and modern Greek, and his more extended works gradually came to be translated into German, French, Italian, and the languages of Denmark and the Scandinavian peninsula. The elements of the colossally grotesque, the wildly primitive in Mark Twain's works, the underlying note of melancholy not less than the lawless bohemianism, found sympathetic appreciation among the Germanic races. George Meredith has likened the functionings of Germanic humor to the heavy-footed antics of a dancing bear. Mark Twain's stories of the Argonauts, the miners, and the desperadoes, with their primitive orgiastic existence, his narratives of the wild freedom of the life on the Mississippi, the lawless feuds and barbaric encounters, all appealed to the passion for the fantastic and the grotesque innate in Germanic consciousness. To the Europeans this wild genius of the Pacific Slope seemed to function in a sort of unexplored fourth dimension of humor, vast and novel, of which they had never dreamed. It is noteworthy that Schleich, in his Psychopathique des Humors, reserved for American humor, with Mark Twain as its leading exponent, a distinct and unique category which he denominated Fantastischen, Grossdimensionalen. To the biographer belongs the task of describing, in detail, the lavish entertainment and open-hearted homage which were bestowed upon Mark Twain in German Europe. In writing of Mark Twain and his popularity in Germanic countries, Karl von Thaler unhesitatingly asserts that Mark Twain was feted, wined, and dined in Vienna, the Austrian metropolis, in an unprecedented manner and awarded unique honors hitherto paid to no German writer. In Berlin, the young Kaiser bestowed upon him the most distinguished marks of his esteem, and praised his works, in a special life on the Mississippi, with the intensest enthusiasm. When Mark Twain received a command from the Kaiser to dine with him, his young daughter exclaimed that if it kept on like this there soon wouldn't be anybody left for him to become acquainted with but God, Mark said that it seemed uncomplimentary to regard him as unacquainted in that quarter, but of course his daughter was young, and the young always jumped to conclusions without reflection. After hearing the Kaiser's eulogy on life on the Mississippi, he was astounded and touched to receive a similar tribute the same evening from the portier of his lodging-house. He loved to dwell upon this in later years declaring it the most extraordinary coincidence of his life that a crowned head and a portier, the very top of an empire and the very bottom of it, should have expressed the very same criticism and delivered the very same verdict upon one of his books, almost in the same hour and the same breath. The German edition of his works, in six volumes, published by Lutz of Stuttgart in 1898, I believe, contained an introduction in which he was hailed as the greatest humorist in the world. Among German critics he was regarded as second only to Dickens in drastic comic situation and depth of feeling. Robinson Crusoe was held to exhibit a limited power of imagination in comparison with the ingenuity and inventiveness of Tom Sawyer. At times the German critics confessed their inability to discover the dividing line between astounding actuality and fantastic exaggeration. The descriptions of the barbaric state of Western America possessed an indescribable fascination for the sedate Europeans. At times Mark Twain's bloody jests froze the laughter on their lips, and his revolver humor made their hair stand on end. Though realizing that the scenes and events described in Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, Roughing It, and life on the Mississippi, could not have been duplicated in Europe, the German critics reveled in them, nonetheless, that 
such adventures were possible only in america perhaps only in the fancy of an american mark twain's greatest strength says von thaler lies in the little sketches the literary snapshots the shorter his work the more striking it is he draws directly from life no other writer has learned to know so many different varieties of men and of circumstances so many strange examples of the genus homo as he no other has taken so strange a course of development the deeper elements of mark twain's humor did not escape the attention of the germans nor fail of appreciation at their hands in his aphorisms embodying at once genuine wit and experience of life they discovered not merely the american author but the universal human being these aphorisms they found worthy of profound and lasting admiration Sintenis found in mark twain a living symptom of the youthful joy in existence a genius capable at will despite his boyish extravagance of the virile formulation of fertile and suggestive ideas his latest critic in germany wrote at the time of his death with a genuine insight into the significance of his work although mark twain's humor moves us to irresistible laughter this is not the main point in his books like all true humorists ist der witz mit dem Welschmerz verbunden he is a witness to higher thoughts and higher emotions and his purpose is to expose bad morals and evil circumstances in order to improve and ennoble mankind the critic of the berliner zeitung asserted that mark twain is loved in germany more than all other humorists english or french because his humor turns fundamentally upon serious and earnest conceptions of life it is a tremendously significant fact that the works of american literature most widely read in germany are the works of striking conjunction ralph waldo emerson and mark twain the jumping frog of calaveras county fired the laugh heard round the world like byron mark twain woke one morning to find himself famous a classic fable which had once evoked inextinguishable laughter in athens was unconsciously retold in the language of angels camp calaveras county where history repeated itself with a precision of detail startling in its miraculous coincidence despite the international fame thus suddenly won by this little fable mark twain had yet to overcome the ingrained opposition of insular prejudice before his position in england and the colonies was established upon a sure and enduring footing in a review of the innocents abroad in the saturday review eighteen seventy the comparison is made between the americans who do europe in six weeks and the most nearly analogous class of british travelers with the following interesting conclusions the american is generally the noisier and more actively disagreeable but on the other hand he often partially redeems his absurdity by a certain naivete and half-conscious humor he is often laughing in his sleeve at his own preposterous brags and does not take himself quite so seriously as his british rival he is vulgar and even ostentatiously and atrociously vulgar but the vulgarity is mixed with a real shrewdness which rescues it from simple insipidity we laugh at him and we would rather not have too much of his company but we do not feel altogether safe in despising him the lordly condescension and gross self-satisfaction here betrayed are but preliminaries to the ludicrous density of the subsequent reflections upon mark twain himself he parades his utter ignorance of continental languages and manners and expresses his very original judgments on various wonders of art and nature with a praiseworthy frankness we are sometimes left in doubt whether he is speaking in all sincerity or whether he is having a sly laugh at himself and his readers it is quite evident that the large mass of english readers represented by the saturday review 
had not caught mark twain's tone but even the reviewer is more than half won over by the infectiousness of this new american humor perhaps we have persuaded our readers by this time that mr twain sick is a very offensive specimen of the vulgarest kind of yankee and yet to say the truth we have a kind of liking for him there is a frankness and originality about his remarks which is sick pleasanter than the merest repetition of stale raptures and his fun if not very refined is often tolerable in its way in short his pages may be turned over with amusement as exhibiting more or less consciously a very lively portrait of the uncultivated american tourist who may be more obtrusive and misjudging but is not quite so stupidly unobservant as our native product we should not choose either of them for our companions on a visit to a church or a picture gallery but we should expect most amusement from the yankee as long as we could stand him it was this review which gave mark twain the opening for his celebrated parody a parody which i have always thought went far to opening the eyes of the british public to the true spirit of his humor such irresistible fun could not fail of appreciation at the hands of a nation which regarded dickens as their representative national author two years later mark twain received in england an appreciative reception of well-nigh national character whilst the literary and academic circles of america withheld their unstinted recognition of an author so primitive and unlettered great britain received him with open arms he was a welcome guest at the houses of the exclusive the highest dignitaries of public life the authoritative journals the leaders of fashion of thought and of opinion openly rejoiced in the breezy unconventionality the fascinating daring and the genial personality of this new variety of american genius his english publisher john camden houghton wrote in eighteen seventy three how he dined with the sheriff of london and middlesex how he spent glorious evenings with the wits and literati who gather round the festive boards of the whitefriars and the savage clubs how he moved in the gay throng at the guildo conversazione how he feasted with the lord mayor of london and was the guest of that ancient and most honorable body the city of london artillery all these matters we should like to dwell upon his public lectures though not so popular as those of artemus ward won him recognition as a master in all the arts of the platform mr h r howes who heard him once at the old hanover square rooms thus describes the occasion the audience was not large nor very enthusiastic i believe he would have been an increasing success had he stayed longer we had not time to get accustomed to his peculiar way and there was nothing to take us by storm as in artemus ward he came on and stood quite alone a little table with the traditional water bottle and tumbler was by his side his appearance was not impressive not very unlike the representation of him in the various pictures in his tramp abroad he spoke more slowly than any other man i ever heard and did not look at his audience quite enough i do not think that he felt altogether at home with us nor we with him he never laughed loud or long no one went into those irrepressible convulsions which used to make artemus pause and look so hurt and surprised we sat throughout expectant and on the qui vive very well interested and gently simmering with amusement with the exception of one exquisite description of the old magdalen ivy covered collegiate buildings at oxford university i do not think there was one thing worth setting down in print i got no information out of the lecture and hardly a joke that would wear or a story that would bear repeating 
there was a deal about the dismal lone silver land the story of the mexican plug that bucked and a duel which never came off and another duel in which no one was injured and we sat patiently enough through it fancying that by and by the introduction would be over and the lecture would begin when twain suddenly made his bow and went off it was over i looked at my watch i was never more taken aback i had been sitting there exactly an hour and twenty minutes it seemed ten minutes at the outside if you have ever tried to address a public meeting you will know what this means it means that mark twain is a consummate public speaker if ever he chose to say anything he would say it marvelously well but in the art of saying nothing in an hour he surpasses our most accomplished parliamentary speakers the nation which had been reared upon the wit of sidney smith the irony of swift the grosse of fielding the extravagance of dickens was ripe for the colossal incongruities and daring contrasts of mark twain they recognized in him not only the most successful and original wag of his day but also a rare genius who shared with walt whitman the honor of being the most strictly american writer of what is called american literature we read in a review of a triumph abroad published in the athenaeum in eighteen eighty mark twain is american pure and simple to the eastern motherland he owes but the rudiments the groundwork already archaic and obsolete to him of the speech he has to write in his turn of art his literary method and aims his intellectual habit and temper he is as distinctly national as the fourth of july mark twain was admired because he was a literary artist of exceptional skill and it was ungrudgingly acknowledged that he has a keen sense of character and uncommon skill in presenting it dramatically and he is also an admirable story-teller with the anecdotic instinct and habit in perfection and with a power of episodic narrative that is scarcely equaled if at all by mr charles reed himself indeed from the early days of the innocents abroad the first transatlantic democratic utterance which found its way into the hearing of the mass of english people during the period of tom sawyer the completest boy in fiction the immortal huckleberry finn the standard picaresque novel of america the least trammeled piece of literature in the language and life on the mississippi vastly appreciated in england as in germany for its counterhistorisch value down to the day when oxford university bestowed the coveted honor of its degree upon mark twain and all england took him to their hearts with fervor and abandon during this long period of almost four decades mark twain progressively strengthened his hold upon the imagination of the english people and like charles dickens before him may be said to have become the representative author of the anglo-saxon race the vast majority of readers here regard him said mr sidney brooks in nineteen o seven to a degree in which they regard no other living writer as their personal friend and love him for his tenderness his masculinity his unfailing wholesomeness even more than for his humor to all who love and admire mark twain these words in which he was welcomed to england in nineteen o seven should stand as a symbol of that racial bond that entente cordiale of blood and heart which he did so much to strengthen and secure a compliment paid to mark twain is something more than a compliment to a great man a great writer and a great citizen it is a compliment to the american people and one that will come home to them with peculiar gratification the feeling for mark twain among his own people is like that of the scotch for sir walter eighty odd years ago or like that of our fathers for 
Charles Dickens. There is admiration in it, gratitude, pride, and, above all, an immense and intimate tenderness of affection. To writers alone it is given to win a sentiment of this quality, to writers, and occasionally by the oddness of the human mind, to generals. Perhaps one would best take the measure of the American devotion to Mark Twain by describing it as a compound of what Dickens enjoyed in England forty years ago, and of what Lord Roberts enjoys today, and by adding something thereto for the intensity of all transatlantic emotions. The popularity of statesmen, even of such a statesman as President Roosevelt, is a poor and flickering light by the side of this full flame of personal affection. It has gone out to Mark Twain not only for what he has written, for the clean, irresistible extravagance of his humor and his unfailing command of the primal feelings, for his tenderness, his jollity, and his power to read the heart of boy and man and woman, not only for the tragedies and afflictions of his life so unconquerably born, not only for his brave and fiery dashes against tyranny, humbug, and corruption at home and abroad, but also because his countrymen feel him to be, beyond all other men, the incarnation of the American spirit. Mark Twain achieved a position of supreme eminence as a representative national author, which is without a parallel in the history of American literature. This position he achieved directly by his appeal to the great mass of the people, despite the dict of the literati. At a time when England and Europe were throwing wide the doors to Mark Twain, the culture of his own land was regarding him with slighting condescension, or with mildly quizzical unconcern. Boston regarded him with fastidious and frigid disapproval. Longfellow and Lowell found little in him to admire or approve. There were notable exceptions, as Mr. Howells has recently pointed out, Charles Eliot Norton, Professor Francis J. Child, and, most notable of all, Mr. Howells himself. But in general it is true that, in proportion as people thought themselves refined, they questioned that quality which all recognize in him now but which was then the inspired knowledge of the simple-hearted multitude. The professors of literature regarded Mark Twain as an author whose works were essentially ephemeral, and stood in the breach for culture against the barbaric invasion of primitive Western barbarism. Professor W. P. Trent was, I believe, the first to cite Professor Richardson's American Literature, published in 1886, as a typical instance of the position of literary culture in regard to Mark Twain. But there is a class of writers, we read in that work, authors ranking below Irving or Lowell, and lacking the higher artistic or moral purpose of the greater humorists, who amuse a generation and then pass from sight. Every period demands a new manner of jest, after the current fashion. The reigning favorites of the day are Frank R. Stockton, Joel Chandler Harris, the various newspaper jokers, and Mark Twain. Note the damning position. But the creators of Pomona and Rudder Grange, of Uncle Remus and his folklore stories, and Innocents Abroad, clever as they are, must make hay while the sun shines. Twenty years hence, unless they chance to enshrine their wit in some higher literary achievement, their unknown successors will be the privileged comedians of the Republic. Humor alone never gives its masters a place in literature. It must coexist with literary qualities, and must usually be joined with such pathos as one finds in Lamb, Hood, Irving or Holmes. This passage stands in the 1892 edition of that work, though Tom Sawyer had appeared in 1876, The Prince and the Pauper in 1882, 
Life on the Mississippi in 1883, Huckleberry Finn in 1884, and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court in 1889. Opinions analogous to those expressed in the passage just cited have found frequent expression among leaders of critical opinion in America, and only yesterday The Jumping Frog and The Innocents Abroad were seriously put forward by a clever and popular American critic as Mark Twain's most enduring claims upon posterity. A bare half-dozen men in the ranks of American literary criticism have recognized and eloquently spoken forth in vindication of Mark Twain's title as a classic author, not simply of American literature, but of the literature of the world. It is even now perhaps not too early to attempt some sort of inquiry into the causes contributory to Mark Twain's recognition as the prime representative of contemporary American literature. One of the cheap catchwords of Mark Twain criticism is the statement that he is American to the core, and that his popular appreciation in his own country was due to the fact that he most completely embodied the national genius. How many of those who confidently advance this vastly significant statement, one curiously wonders, have seriously endeavored to make plain to others, or even to themselves, the reasons therefor? Perhaps in seeking the causes for Mark Twain's renown in his own country, one may discover the causes for his worldwide fame. A map of the United States, upon which were marked the localities and regions made famous by the writings of Mark Twain, would show that, geographically, he has known and studied this vast country in all the grand divisions of its composition. Bred from old southern stock, born in the southwest, he passed his youth upon the bosom of that great natural division between east and west, the Mississippi River, which cleaves in twain the very body of the nation. In the twenties he lost the feeling of local attachment in the vast democracy of the West, and looked life, a strangely barbaric and primitive life, straight in the face. This is the first great transformation in his life. Behold the Westerner! After enriching his mind through contact with civilization so diverse as Europe and the Sandwich Islands, he settled down in Connecticut boldly forswore the creeds and principles of his native section, and underwent a new transformation. Behold the Yankee! Once again, travel in foreign lands, association with the most intellectual and cultured circles of the world, broadened his vision. Yet this cosmopolitan experience, far from diminishing his racial consciousness, tended still further to accentuate the national characteristics. In this new transformation we behold the typical American. The later years of cosmopolitan renown, of world-wide fame, throw into high relief the last transformation. Behold the universally human spirit. Under this crude catalogue, the main lines of Mark Twain's development stand out in sharp definition. The catalogue, however, is only too crude. It is impossible to say with precision just when such and such a transformation actually took place. It is only intended to be suggestive, for we must bear in mind that Mark Twain never changed character. His spirit underwent an evolutionary process, broadening, deepening, enlarging its vision with the passage of the years. End of Part 1 of The World-Famed Genius Read by John Greenman. This is section seven of Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and read by John Greenman. The part which the South played in the formation of the character and genius of Mark Twain has been little noted heretofore. It was in the South and Southwest that the creator of the humor of local eccentrics first appeared in full flower, and Ned Brace, Major Jones, and Sut Lovengood have in them the germs of that later Western humor that was to come to full fruition in the works of Bret Hart and Mark Twain. The stagecoach and the river steamboat furnished the means of disseminating far and wide the gross, 
the ghastly, the extravagant stories, the oddities of speech, the fantastic jests which emerged from the clash of diverse and oddly assorted types, the jarring contrasts, the incongruities and surprises daily furnished by the picturesque river life unquestionably stimulated and fertilized the latent germs of humor in the young cub pilot sam clemens through mark twain's greatest works flows the stately mississippi magically imparting to them some indefinable share of its beauty its variety its majesty its immensity and there is no exaggeration in the conclusion that it is the greatest natural influence which his works betray reared in a slave-holding community of narrow-visioned arrogantly provincial people of the lower middle class seeing his own father so degrade himself as to cuff his negro houseboy consorting with ragamuffins the ragtag and bobtail of the town in his passion for bohemianism and truantry young clemens never learned to know the beauty and the dignity the purity and the humanity of that aristocratic patriarchal south which produced such beautiful figures as lee and lanier not even his most enthusiastic biographers have attempted to palliate save with half-hearted facetiousness his inglorious desertion of the cause which he had espoused mark twain is the most speedily reconstructed rebel on record is it broad-minded or even accurate for mr howells to say of mark twain no one has ever poured such scorn upon the second-hand walter scotticized pseudo-chivalry of the southern ideal mark twain never i firmly believe held up to ridicule the southern ideal but in a well-known and excellent passage in life on the mississippi he properly pokes fun at the wordy windy flowery eloquence romanticism sentimentality all imitated from sir walter scott of the southern literary journal of the thirties and forties in later years mark twain in his joan of arc voiced a spirit of noble chivalry which bespoke the southern ideal of his virginia forebears and that delicacy of instinct in manners of right and wrong which is so conspicuous a trait of mark twain's is a symptom of that moral elegance which mr owen wister has pronounced to be one of the defining characteristics of the southern american no american of northern birth or breeding mr howells pertinently observes could have imagined the spiritual struggle of huck finn in deciding to help the negro jim to his freedom even though he should be forever despised as a negro thief in his own town and perhaps eternally lost through the blackness of his sin no northerner could have come so close to the heart of a kentucky feud and revealed it so perfectly with the whimsicality playing through its carnage or could have so brought us into the presence of the sardonic commie tragedy of the squalid little river town where the store-keeping magnet shoots down his drunken tormentor in the arms of the drunkard's daughter and then cows with bitter mockery the mob that comes to lynch him the influence of the west upon the character and genius of mark twain is momentous and unmistakable mark twain found room for development and expansion in the primitive freedom of the west it was here i think that there were bred in him that breezy democracy of sentiment and that hatred of sham and pretense which fill his writings from the beginning to end in the west virgin yet recalcitrant every man stood or fell by force of his own exertions every man without fear or favor struggled for fortune for competence or for existence it was a case of the survival of the fittest in face of bleak nature the burning alkali desert the obdurate soil the rock-ribbed mountains all men were free and equal in a camaraderie of personal effort in this primitive democracy every man demanded for himself what he saw others getting the pretender the hypocrite the sham 
the humbug soon went to the wall exposed in the nakedness of his own impotency humor is a salutary aid in the struggle of the individual with the contrasts of life indeed it may be said to be born of the perception of those contrasts in a degree no whit inferior to the variegated river life the life of the west furnished contrasts and incongruities innumerable vaster perhaps and more significant there was the incessant contrast of civilization with barbarism of the east with the west and there was infinite play for the comic expose of the credulous tenderfoot at the hands of the pitiless cowboy roars of gargantuan laughter shook the skies as each new initiate unwillingly succumbed to the demoniac wiles of his tormentors the west was one vast theatre for the practice of the practical joke behind everything menacing foreboding tragic lay the stupendous contrast between man and nature and though the miner the granger the cowboy laughed defiantly at civilization and at nature there crept into the consciousness of each the conviction that in the long run civilization must triumph and that in order to win success nature must be conquered and subdued in such an environment with its spirit of primitive democracy its atmosphere of wild and ribald jest its contempt for the impostor its perpetually recurring incongruities and behind all the solemn perhaps tragic presence of inexorable nature in such an environment were sharpened and wetted in mark twain the sense of humor the spirit of real democracy bred of competitive effort and the hatred for pretense sham and imposture it was not i think until mark twain went to live in connecticut and as he expressed it became a scribbler of books and an immovable fixture among the other rocks of new england that he developed complete confidence in himself and his powers that passion for successful self-expression which mr nicholas murray butler has defined as the main ambition of the american became the dominant motive of mark twain's life of his experience as a steamboat pilot mark twain has said that in that brief sharp schooling he got personally and familiarly acquainted with about all the different types of human nature that are to be found in fiction biography or history in the west he had still further enriched his mind with an inexhaustible store of first-hand knowledge of human nature in rotation he had been tramping jour printer river pilot private secretary miner reporter lecturer he now turns to literature in real earnest and begins to display that vast store of knowledge derived from actual contact with the infinitely diversified realities of american life mark twain takes on more and more the characteristics of the yankee those characteristics which constitute the basis of his success inventiveness and ingenuity the practical efficiency the shrewdness and the hard common sense it is the last phase in the formation of the national type it was i venture to say in some such way as this that mark twain came to assume in the eyes of his countrymen an embodiment of the national spirit he was the self-made man in the self-made democracy he was at once his own creation and the creation of a democracy there were humorists in america before mark twain there are humorists in america still but mark twain succeeded not merely in captivating the great mass of the people he achieved the far more difficult and unique distinction of convincing his countrymen of his essential fellowship his temperamental affinity with them this miracle he wrought by the frankest and most straightforward revelation of the actual experiences in his own life and the lives of those he had known with perfect intimacy it is true that he wrote a few books dealing with other times other scenes than our own in the present and in america but i dare say that his popularity with the mass of his countrymen would not have been in any degree lessened had he never written these few books 
indeed it is hardly to be doubted that his books were successful in the ratio of their autobiographic nature for the character he revealed in those books of his which are essentially autobiographic is the character dear to the american heart and the experiences vicissitudes and hardships shot through and irradiated with a high boisterousness of humor found a joyous sympathy in the minds and hearts of men who had all been there themselves in mark twain the american people recognized at last the sturdy democrat independent of foreign criticism confident in the validity and value of his own ideas and judgments believing loyally in his country's institutions and upholding them fearlessly before the world fundamentally serious and self-reliant yet with a practicality tempered by humane kindliness warmth of heart and a strain of persistent idealism rude boisterous even uncouth yet withal softened by sympathy for the underdog a boundless love for the weak the friendless the oppressed lacking in profound intellectuality yet supreme in the possession of the simple and homely virtues an upright an honorable character a good citizen a man tenacious of the sanctity of the domestic virtues america has produced finer and more exalted types giants in intellectuality princes in refinement and delicacy of spirit savants in culture classics in authorship an american type combining culture with picturesqueness refinement with patriotism suavity with self-reliance desire it as we may still awaits the imprimatur of international recognition america has sufficient cause for gratification in the memory of that quaint and sturdy figure so conspicuously bearing the national stamp and superscription perhaps no american has equaled mark twain in the quality of subsuming and embodying in his own character so many elements of the national spirit and genius in letters in life mark twain is the american par excellence underneath those qualities which combined to produce in mark twain a composite american type lay something deeper still that indefinable je ne sais quoi which procured him international fame humor alone is utterly inadequate for achieving so momentous a result though humor ostensibly constituted the burden of the appeal as a matter of fact vehemently as the professors may deny it mark twain was an artist of remarkable force and power from the days when he came under the tutelage of mr howells and humbly learned to prune away his stylistic superfluities of the grosser sort mark twain indubitably began to subject himself to the discipline of stern self-criticism while it is true that he never learned to realize in full measure to use pater's phrase the responsibility of the artist to his materials he assuredly disciplined himself to make the most in his own way of the rude and volcanic power which he possessed it is fortunate that mark twain never subjected himself to the refinements of academic culture a harvard might well have spoiled a great author for mark twain had a memorable tale to tell of rude primitive men and barbaric remote scenes and circumstances of truant and resourceful boyhood exercising all its cunning in circumventing circumstance and mastering a calling and he had that tale to tell in the unlettered yet vastly expressive phraseology of the actors in those wild events the secret of his style is directness of thought a sort of shattering clarity of utterance and a mastery of vital vigorous audacious individual expression he had a remarkable feeling for words and their uses and his language is the unspoiled expressive language of the people at times he is primitive and coarse but it is a falstaffian note the mark of universality rather than of limitation his art was in tolstoy's phrase the art of a people universal art and his style was rich in the locutions of the common people rich and racy of the soil a signal merit of his style is its admirable adaptation to the theme the personages of his novels always speak in character 
with perfect reproduction not only of their natural speech but also of their natural thoughts though mr henry james may have said that one must be a very rudimentary person to enjoy mark twain there is unimpeachable virtue in a rudimentary style in treatment of rudimentary or as i should prefer to phrase it fundamental things mr james i feel sure could never have put into the mouth of a rudimentary person like huck so vivid and graphic a description of a storm with its perfect reproduction of the impression caught by the rudimentary mind writers of fiction says sir walter Bissant, in speaking of this book will understand the difficulty of getting inside the brain of that boy seeing things as he saw them writing as he would have written and acting as he would have acted and presenting to the world true faithful and living effigies of that boy the feat has been accomplished there is no character in fiction more fully more faithfully presented than the character of huckleberry finn it may be objected that the characters are extravagant not so they are all exactly and literally true they are quite possible in a country so remote and so primitive every figure in the book is a type huckleberry finn has exaggerated none we see the life the dull and vacuous life of a small township upon the mississippi river forty years ago so far as i know it is the only place where we can find that phrase of life portrayed mark twain impressed one always as writing with utter individuality untrammeled by the limitations of any particular sect of art in his books of travel he reveals not only the instinct of the trained journalist for the novel and the effective but also the feeling of the artist for the beautiful the impressive and the sublime his descriptions of striking natural objects such as the volcano of mount kilauea in the sandwich islands of memorable architecture such as the cathedral at milan show that he possessed the stereoscopic imagination in rare degree the picture he evokes of athens by moonlight in the language of simplicity and restraint ineffaceably fixes itself in the fancy mark twain was regarded in france as a remarkable impressionist and praised by the critics for the realistic accuracy and minuteness of his delineation kipling frankly acknowledged the great debt that he owed him tennyson spoke in high praise of his finesse in the choice of words his feeling for the just word to catch and as it were visualize the precise shade of meaning desired in truth mark twain was an impressionist rather than an imaginative artist that passage in a yankee in king arthur's court in which he describes an early morning ride through the forest pictorially evocative as it is stands self-revealed a confusedly imaginative effort to create an image he has never experienced if we set over beside this the remarkable descriptions of things seen as minutely evocative as instantaneous photographs such for example as the picture of a summer storm or preferably the picture of dawn on the mississippi both from huckleberry finn pictures mark twain had seen and lived hundreds of times we see at once the striking superiority of the realistic impressionist over the imaginative artist i have always felt that the most lasting influence of his life the influence which has left the most pervasive impression upon his art and thought is portrayed in that classic and memorable passage in which he portrays the marvelous spell laid upon him by that mistress of his youth the great river to the young pilot the face of the water in time became a wonderful book for the uninitiated traveler it was a dead language but to the young pilot it gave up its most cherished secrets he came to feel that there had never been so wonderful a book written by man to its haunting beauty its enfolding mystery he yielded himself unreservedly drinking it in like one bewitched but a day came when he began to cease from noting its marvels another day came when he ceased altogether to note them in time he came to realize that for him the romance and the beauty were gone forever from the river if the early rapture was gone in its place was the deeper sense of knowledge and intimacy 
he had learned the ultimate secrets of the river learned them with a knowledge so searching and so profound that he was enabled to give them the enduring investiture of art mark twain possessed the gift of innate eloquence he was a master of the art of moving touching swaying an audience at times his insight into the mysterious springs of humor of passion and of pathos seemed almost like divination all these qualities appeared in full flower in the written expression of his art it would be doing a disservice to his memory to deny that his style did not possess literary distinction or elegance at times his judgment was at fault his constitutional humor came near playing havoc with his artistic sense not seldom he was long-winded and laborious in his striving after comic effect to offset these manifest lapses and defects there are the many fine qualities descriptive passages aglow with serene and cloudless beauty dramatic scenes depicted with virile and rugged eloquence pathetic incidents touched with gentle and caressing tenderness style bears translation ill in fact translation is not infrequently impossible but mr clemens once pointed out to me that humor has nothing to do with style mark twain's humor for humor is his prevalent mood has international range since constructed out of a deep comprehension of human nature and a profound sympathy for human relationship and human failing it successfully surmounts the difficulties of translation into alien tongues mark twain became a great international figure not because he was an american paradoxical and unpatriotic as that may sound but because he was america's greatest cosmopolitan he was a true cosmopolitan in the higginsonian sense in that unlike mr henry james he was at home even in his own country he was a true cosmopolitan in the tolstoyan sense for his was art transmitting the simplest feelings of common life but such always as are accessible to all men in the whole world the art of common life the art of a people universal art his spirit grasped the true ideal of our time and reflected it mr clemens attributed his international success not to the qualities of style not to allegiance to any distinctive school not to any overtopping eminence of intellect many so-called american humorists he once remarked to me have been betrayed by their preoccupation with the local their work never crossed frontiers because they failed to impart to their humor that universal element which appeals to all races of men realism is nothing more than close observation but observation will never give you the inside of the thing the life the genius the soul of a people are realized only through years of absorption mr clemens asseverated that the only way to be a great american humorist was to be a great human humorist to discover in americans those permanent and universal traits common to all nationalities in his commentary upon bourget's outre-mer he declared that there wasn't a single human characteristic that could safely be labeled american not a single detail inside or outside through years of automatic observation mark twain learned to discover for america to adapt his own phrase those few human peculiarities that can be generalized and located here and there in the world and named by the name of the nation where they are found above all i think mark twain sympathized with and found something to admire in the citizens of every nation seeking beneath the surface veneer the universal traits of that nation's humanity he expressly disclaimed in my presence any attitude toward the world for the very simple reason that his relation toward all peoples had been one of the effort at comprehension of their ideals and identification with them in feeling 
he disavowed any color prejudices caste prejudices or creed prejudices maintaining that he could stand any society all that he cared to know was that a man was a human being that was bad enough for him it is a matter not of argument but of fact that mark twain has made more damaging admissions concerning america than concerning any other nation lafcadio hearn best succeeded in interpreting poetry to his japanese students by freeing it from all artificial and local restraints and using as examples the simplest lyrics which go straight to the heart and soul of man his remarkable lecture on naked poetry is the most signal illustration of his profoundly suggestive mode of interpretation in the same way mark twain as humorist has sought the highest common factor of all nations my secret if there is any secret mr clemens once said to me is to create humor independent of local conditions in studying humanity as exhibited in the people and localities i best knew and understood i have sought to winnow out the encumbrance of the local and he significantly added musingly humor like morality has its eternal verities to the literature of the world i venture to say mark twain has contributed his masterpiece that provincial odyssey of the mississippi huckleberry finn a picaresque romance worthy to rank with the very best examples of picaresque fiction tom sawyer only little inferior to its pendant story which might well be regarded as the supreme american morality play of youth everybody the man that corrupted hadleyburg an ironic fable of such originality and dexterous creation that it has no satisfactory parallel in literature the first half of life on the mississippi and all of roughing it for their reflections of the sociological phases of a civilization now vanished forever it is gratifying to americans to recognize in mark twain the incarnation of democratic america it is gratifying to citizens of all nationalities to recall and recapture the pleasure and delight his works have given them for decades it is more gratifying still to rest confident in the belief that in mark twain america has contributed to the world of genius sealed of the tribe of moliere a congener of lesage of fielding of defoe a man who will be remembered as mr howells has said with the great humorists of all time with cervantes with swift or with any others worthy his company none of them was his equal in humanity end of part two of the world-famed genius read by john greenman